Hi friends, welcome to another episode of I Wanna Know, the show dedicated to our government, people involved in our government, and how our government ticks. Often we have volunteers and people involved in the community as well. But today we have another candidate. I'm lucky enough to be joined, uh, joining me, Vince Mace, who's running for the 86th State District, which covers Brantford, North, uh, not Brantford, North Brantford, Northford, um, Wallingford, Guilford, and Durham, correct? Yes. Okay, very good. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate your time in doing this. Thank you for the invitation. Um, you're welcome. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you? All right. Um, my name is Vince Mace. I've been in town since 1984, 36 years. Right. Um, I have three children. All three of my children went through the North Brantford school system. <clears throat> Our, all three are graduates of North Brantford High School, went on to colleges, went on to careers. Um, I have eight grandchildren, and uh, my wife and I are very happy living in town, and we've been very happy for 36 years to be in town and be a part of this town. Wow, fantastic. That's a long time, a lot of history. Yep. Uh, your roots are here, basically, with all the family. Um, what do you do professionally? Well, currently, I'm a lawyer and also a president of a union. Um, what union? The National Association of Letter Carriers. Our local number is Branch 19. So you were a postal worker carrier before you became an attorney, correct? Yes. That's I a start, fascinating story. Started the post office in 1974 and retired in 2005 with a little over 30 years of service. So I was a letter carrier, mailman, went house to house, and, you know, delivering the mail. Where did you uh, do that? I did it mostly in the Fairhaven section. Okay. That was primarily the area I was familiar with. That's where I grew up, and uh, that's where I delivered mail for most of my career. Did you have the same route and same territory the whole 30 years? No, no. I, uh, uh, when you first come in, based on your seniority, you bid a job, and then you always move around to see what would be a better location. Mm -hmm. And as your seniority gets higher and higher, you're able to bid a better job here and there, and that's what I did. Um, for 30 years, so you became, you were a letter carrier, and then you moved up, right, in the Postal Service, and you became head of the Postal Union. Well, you don't move up, you run for election, and you run, uh, just like I'm running for the 86th District, okay. I ran against somebody for the position for president, and in 2005 I won, and I was sworn in in January 2006, and I've been the president for the past 15 years. Was running for that similar to running for office? Yeah, it is. You know, it's politics, it's campaigning, it's getting the, your word out, getting the message out. Very similar. How many union members are there? Uh, I, have, I have approximately 775 union members in my local. And is that in, the, is like in, that in a New Haven district? or? Yeah, well, it covers uh, East Haven, West Haven, New Haven, Branford, Guilford, uh, Clinton, Wallingford, North Haven, Cheshire, Deep River. Wow, so large, that's large The area, area is right. Um, and so how long have you been president of the union there? 15 years now, and um, elections will be coming up again in the within the next uh, several months or so, and I'll run again. So was that when you were really focusing on politics as well? Or no. were you, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how did that morph into the interest in politics? I, uh, I always wanted to be a lawyer. Really. I used to watch all martial counsel at law. I watched all of those Perry Mason Growing up, I watched all of those law programs, you know, and um, I was lucky enough while I was working for the post office to be able to go to college and go to uh, law school and um, graduate from law school in 2003 and get sworn in. I passed the bar in the first chance. Wow. And I've been practicing basically for the past 17 years as a lawyer. Um, because I work for the post office, I don't know if you're familiar with the Hatch Act. We are what they call hatched. Mm -hmm. We cannot be involved in politics. Um, and that was difficult because there was very little we could do with politicians. And although I may have been very interested in politics, um, couldn't do anything because I was You couldn't be affiliated with no. campaigns? You couldn't no. be affiliated? Okay. No. No. Um, but now that you're retired from the post office, you're free to do whatever you want. Yes. As an attorney. Yes. Um, okay. So that prevented you from being involved with politics at the time. As a postal employee, yes, you're, you're, you're forbidden to prohibit them from being involved with uh, bipartisan politics. Um, I mean, we can go to a meeting or something, or we can attend a campaign function, but we couldn't actively be 
be campaign, involved. Campaign, right. act, actively campaign for right. at that time, yes. a candidate. Okay. Well, at the time, so is that Well, there's some restrictions. They've relaxed some of the restrictions. I see. Okay. You know, when we first went into the post office back in the early 70s, we weren't even supposed to talk politics on the working floor, you know, that was prohibited. But as the years went by, the unions have gotten involved with um, getting Congress people and to relax the restrictions so that now if you're uh, a postal employee, you can make a phone call on behalf of uh, people. You could uh, go around and hand out literature, uh, but you can't run for office as a postal employee. You can't actively run for office. Okay. But right, right now, over the past 46 years, they've, restri they've re relaxed some of the restrictions. I see. Okay. Um, so since then, you've been an attorney. Yes. Um, what do you focus on with your practice? Uh, I do uh, a lot of labor and employment. I do uh, some family law, uh, some real estate, some probate, and okay. uh, personal tort injuries. How has COVID affected all those cases? I mean, the courts have been shut down. Is that true? Or? <laughs> yeah, the, court, the courts have been shut down. Uh, the court system has been overtaxed and struggling as well. Uh, they're beginning to ease up now because... Uh, they're doing a virtual pre-trials. Yeah, they, uh, you had to sign up for Microsoft Teamworks, and now they do virtual stuff, and pretty soon they're going to start doing what they call short calendars, where people file motions on particular lawsuits, and they're going to start doing that by virtual uh, technology. The backlog must be amazing. Yeah, well, as you well know, you know, especially with foreclosures and you know, family law and uh, a lot of things, they are back up. And I mean, because they really have to handle emergency situations. Well, in criminal law, you know, you have to arraign people within a certain time. So they're a little bit different than, um, I don't really do criminal law, but right, right. they're a little bit different than we are. But the civil end of things civil end, is really yes. backed up. We're yes. getting ramped up with technology. Yeah, and I'm sure the judges, uh, you, you can't go into the courthouses right now. You know, they're COVID-19. They're very, very, very strict about going into a meeting with anybody. So everything is being done by camera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, um, so you, you decided to run for office. Yes. Last cycle. Um, what was your experience then? Um, and how did you view, how did you, did you like campaigning back? Do you like campaigning? Um, and how is that different now during COVID, two years later? Well, two years ago, you were able to go house to house if you can in neighborhoods and go door knocking and try and introduce yourself to people. Or you could be on a neighbor, in a neighborhood where people are out on their driveway or stuff. Where sure, you, you can just walk talking. up and down a street yeah. or drive in your car and stop and say, I, Hi, I'm, I'm so-and-so, I'm running for office, this is that. You know, uh, for the most part, people are pretty cordial. You know, uh, some people have said, I made up my mind, I'm all set. Right. You, know, you just walk away and go to the next house or whatever. Sure, sure. Now, um, it's kind of hard. Um, I haven't started to go knocking on doors just yet. Uh, we're trying to figure out how we're going to do that because you have to have a mask now, okay? Right, right. And, and be socially distanced. And, and social distance. And, and, and so it's not like you can knock on somebody's door easily because you, right then you're within three or two feet of somebody. Yeah. And people, you know, people are kind of skeptical now about people, strangers coming up to their door. Okay. You know, especially with masks on and everything else, you know. And they don't want to get infected because they don't know where you've been. And right, sure. you have to worry about where they've been. So sure, sure. It's a little bit difficult now. So then how has the focus changed? Well, the focus changes to social media. You know, places like this here where you get interviewed. Um, the newspapers, if they call up and they want to interview, uh, you get questionnaires that you answer questions to certain organizations and that's how it's going and you know my campaign will be kicking off very shortly with a lot of social media a lot of video uh, mailings mailings okay newspaper ads you know right. those are those are the ways to get the word out okay okay i mean social media you know it's effective but also it's impersonal yes you know and i personally have always enjoyed the personal interaction i mean in interviewing you here is much more enjoyable than doing a zoom you know, because you get people's body language and you get the, you know, what they're thinking, much more uh, dynamic interaction. But it is what it is, right? We have right. to be healthy. That's a, the most uh, important thing here. Well, we have to be healthy. We, to, we have to make sure that the people we interact with are not offended and they're healthy as well. Right, sure. So that's the dangers today with this COVID-19. Sure. And as you well know, many of the scientists are predicting a second wave. 
and it's well, going to become sometime. You know, unfortunately, everybody, you know, we have seen a slight uptick in Connecticut, and yep. Connecticut's been doing really well. Um, we've held the, you know, our infection rate below 1.1, which is one of the best in the country. But now, you know, maybe with kids going back to school, colleges getting back, um, maybe we're on. We're going to see a slight uptick. Well, um, with high school sports and uh, park and rec sports right. and college sports, yeah, you are starting to see, you're reading in the papers that more and more athletes are getting tested for positive and then they have to quarantine the other athletes and right. it's going to have a negative effect at some point in time. So Contact well. tracing is going to be a whole new Very industry. Difficult. Yeah. You know. Um, so you decided to run again. Um, what are the issues that really interest you? Um, you know, what are you really interested in focusing on as far as, you know, I mean, we have, before COVID, we had tolls, we had infrastructure issues, we had tax debates, you know, um, and, you know, COVID has kind of changed the dynamic. It hasn't um, meant that those are not issues, but they've been pushed back so we can struggle with what we're struggling, deal with what we're struggling with, I should say. Um, but tell me, like, what you think, you know, the issues are that, are highest for you? Well, right now what's going on with the state of Connecticut is you have a lot of uh, landlord tenant issues, a lot of eviction situations. Um, so people are out of, of work? A lot of landlords are upset because they can't evict people and a lot of people are out of work and they can't pay their rent. Right. And uh, a lot of homeowners um, foreclosures and um, they're hopefully getting some legal help so to stop the foreclosures until they, they're able to get back on their feet. Who knows so, how long that's gonna last? So who, long, who knows how long the forbearance, mortgage forbearance is gonna last? Who knows how long the moratorium on evictions is gonna last? And people are gonna be in a lot of trouble when those are allowed to proceed, per, you know, correct? Yes, well, there'll be a flooding of the housing courts and there'll be a flooding of the uh, civil uh, actions in courts. And, uh, but you know what? Judges are human too. They understand, they know what's going on. And although, yeah, we certainly have some empathy for the uh, landlords because they're not getting their rents, but um, we have to have a little more empathy for the tenants because uh, they have to put food on the table for the families as a, and also try and have a roof over their heads as well. And how can we have 20 or 30 or 40,000 people evicted? Where are they gonna go? Right, all these families up, you yeah, know, up so, and rooted again. So it's a conundrum, it, it really is that, you know, um, there's no really easy out of it, you know, and uh, I want to be a part of trying to fix that. Trying for to the negotiate, negotiate our way out of things so everybody can find a happy medium, right? Well, that's what attorneys are supposed to do. Um, you're supposed to be able to find some self-help first and try and negotiate things. Um, each side loses a little bit of something, but each side gains something at the same time as well so that everybody walks away saying, okay, it was a good negotiation, mm -hmm. you know? One side doesn't beat up the other side badly, you know? Right, right. Uh, and, that's, and I have to worry about foreclosures too with uh, homeowners, right? Uh, right now, foreclosures are on hold. You know, people are filing for extensions and everything else. And what will happen is once that eases up, uh, a lot of them are going to mediation. Right. And if you represent somebody in a foreclosure mediation, you sit with a mediator, and the banking uh, sends in their attorney and you go in with your client and you try to work something out, you know? Mm -hmm. Hopefully maybe rewrite the loan or, or try and do something to help. You wanna help the bank, but you also wanna help the homeowner too. You don't want them to lose their house. Well, right, I mean, it's my understanding that, you know, the homeowner doesn't wanna lose their home and the bank doesn't want their property. Right. Because all we're gonna have, all they have is like a property that's a liability for them. Right, and then you know the homeowner has got to be uprooted, move their family, some who knows where. Where that's right. So that's a really tough situation. Yeah. So um, the other thing too is you know our economy isn't as bad off as uh, many other states. Right. Um, if you read recently in the Hartford Current, um, Connecticut came in with either a thirty-six million dollar, thirty-nine million dollar surplus. That's not bad for what we've gone through from February until the present, okay? With the state being shut down for almost eight to 10 the weeks. The loss in tax revenue must be incredible. It was unbelievable, yeah. but you know what? We came out with a surplus, and you have to give the governor uh, and, and his administration kudos for saying, hey, you did a good job because they anticipated a big loss, and we came out with a surplus. Right, right. It's that so, rainy day fund. Yeah, this, well. If this, if this isn't a rainy day, I don't know what is, yeah. you know. I mean, this is the perfect storm. 
Um, so hopefully, yeah, I mean, it, so then those funds enable, you know, the state workers to get paid. Right. Right. Um, we can continue on plowing the roads um, and providing the services that people, the taxpayers need and, and expect. Well, your most vulnerable group are your senior citizens. And, you know, you don't want a senior citizen to make a choice between uh, food on the table, a meal, and their medication. Right, you know? right. So, so we have to help the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable being your senior, senior citizens. And uh, in COVID-19, they're the most vulnerable to catch it as well. So we have to, be, we have to worry about them. Right. So it's not easy, you know, and uh, like I said, I think the, uh, the current administration in the state of Connecticut has done a pretty good job of keeping things moving forward. Right, right. Um, what other issues are you campaigning on? Um, I think tourism. I, 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 I want to see Connecticut have more tourists come through Connecticut and stop. Um, there's so many great cities in Connecticut and so many things to offer. Uh, recently, you know, I did a, a little, you know, uh, overnight trip to Mystic, Connecticut, you know, um, to see what's going on there, you know, with the, uh, the hotels and the restaurants and, par and patronizing, you know, um, the Connecticut facilities. Uh, one of the things I think we should have done more of or had more is patronizing businesses in the 86th district, our restaurants, um, you know, our, our stores, uh, you know, patronizing them because they needed our help and we should be there for our grocery stores. We should be there for them. And you, I'm sure you're aware of the, you know, agritourism agri that we're really focusing on here in North Brantford and Northford. Um, you know, in your district, basically, that, that you want to represent because, you know, the wineries, we have the breweries. Um, that's really the, you know, the, one of the tools in our toolbox that we can use to promote the area. Well, I want to know what's going on in the farmers. You know, I, I don't know. You don't see much written about the farmers, you know, what's going on in their worlds and what's happening. Um, if you know over, uh, uh, we want to keep the farms. We don't want the farmers to sell off the land and just start building new neighborhoods and everything else. We want to try and keep the agricultural here. Uh, and so I don't hear much about the farmers, and I want to be a part of that to find out what's going on in their worlds, not only in North Brantford and Northford, but Guilford, Durham, and Wallingford. They have farmlands too. Sure, sure. So I want to be a part of that there. Um, so as far as politics, you know, you're running as a Dem, what politicians do you admire? Past, present? <laughs> I mean, it's a difficult question to ask, especially today, but there are um, really good politicians out there that do a good job of representing the people. All right. I love, I love elder statesmen. Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Great elder statesman. Um... James Madison, another statesman. Um, as we move forward, um, Andrew Jackson. And what do you like about these? They, they knew how to write. They knew how to speak. Um, they went through revolutions. They went through wars. And they came out forming this country. And many of your politicians through the 1800s and 1900s replicated what the, their, their predecessors did. And uh, I do a lot of reading, especially with the presidents of the United States. And, um, you know, FDR, John F. Kennedy, uh, these guys who can get out there, they could talk, they can convince, you know, FDR with his fireside chats. Uh, John F. Kennedy was a great, great orator. He, was, he, was out, he could debate. He was absolutely terrific. Um, currently, modern-day uh, um, politicians, um, I think Rosa DeLauro is a terrific politician. She's been in office for a long time. She's done a lot for the third district, and she's a great orator, too. Uh, I've been in the presence of uh, Richard Blumenthal. As you well know, the, um, the mail ballot right, has right. become a big item, right. okay? In my 46 years involved with the Postal Service, that is a big, big-ticket item. And I went around with uh, Richard Blumenthal and Rosa DeLauro and Joe Courtney, uh, giving speeches about the mail-in ballot and how it works. And uh, Blumenthal is another terrific politician. Courtney's a great politician, too. So I've been in their company. Uh, I've spoken on their behalf and with their behalf, uh, trying to save, the, you know, the, uh, what the rumors going about the Postal Service. And well, the, the Postal Service has been politicized. You very know? much so, yes. Uh, and, it, and it's been hamstrung by Congress. I mean, it, first of all, you know, they have to fund their you know, their pension to 75 years out or something like that? Well, no, here, here's what happened. What was the In 2006, 
Congress passed a law that the Postal Service has to pre-fund retirement health benefits 75 years into the future at $50 billion. So who else has to do that? Nobody in the, nobody in the country has to do that. No private company, no government no, agency. Right. Now, every year from 2006 until this year, the revenue from the Postal Service, and it's not tax dollars, so people have to understand that. We sell a product. Mm -hmm. We sell a stamp and we sell a service. What happened was we were operated in the black every year. We had to start paying $5 billion a year. And once we started paying $5 billion a year, at a certain point in time, it caught up with us and it made us go into the red. Sure. If we didn't have to pay the $5 billion for those years, then we would have operated in the black from 2006 until this past year. With the pandemic, like everything else, People weren't mailing and everything else, and it was a little. Everything bit really ground to a halt. Yes, including business, yeah. right? And that's a big, you know, part of what the post office does. Well, what happened was, uh, we were without the, the the past three postmaster generals have come through the rank and file. Right. Potter, Donahoe, and Megan Brennan, they came up as clerks or carriers, and they came through the rank and file. They knew how to run the post office. The recent now that postmaster you have general. Appointees, yeah, and he, uh, he's a businessman, and you heard all about his business with uh, the President of the United States, and he decided to dismantle 600 fast sorting machines. These machines sort 36,000 to 39,000 letters an hour, okay? Dismantle 600 of them. Your mailboxes on the corner, he They're picked off thousands, <laughs> thousands of them. So he's making it difficult for people to vote by mail, basically. That's part of the problem. So is there a logic behind that, or is it just to, you know, prevent the service from doing its job? Well, here's I mean, you're kind of like, you know, if Amtrak, if they took the rail out from my Amtrak, you're not going to have rails. Well, you know, you're not going to have Amtrak. Well, it's not my logic, but uh, two judges have ruled that uh, they thought the uh, Postmaster General was interfering in the election process, and they ordered him to stop everything. And so far, right now, all of those programs are on halt until after the election. But has the damage been done, though? I mean, oh, the, yeah. the machines no. are still gone. The machines are gone. As a matter of fact, one of the judges had ordered that the machines be put back together, and the Postmaster General, according to the newspaper, has said that they don't have the parts to put the machines back together, so they can't do that. They were dismantled. And our Attorney General in Connecticut, he filed a lawsuit as well, you know? He was right on top of his game. Right, right. And he went to Hartford, where he showed in the parking lot two machines that were dismantled uh, on a the box news. box of parts. Yes. So... So, so yeah, the difference between, you know, Jefferson's time and our time is that everything is politicized, right? But also it would seem, you know, back in the day that it was much easier for people to discuss issues with other people, politicians, regardless of the party, right? I mean, that's how big, you know, wonderful agreements and achievements for our country came to be because both parties were willing to discuss issues with each other. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Well, there has to be maturity involved, Dan. I yeah. mean, you want to, I don't mind debating my opponent or anybody. Uh, I've done it in the union, I'll do it here. But you know what? Um, doesn't need to be insults. Let's talk about the facts. Right, right. What has Not happened? Not the personality. What has happened in the 86th district in the past two years or four years? How much have we improved? What benefits? Has our revenues in town gone up for all of those towns? Wait a minute. How about when there's an important meeting? Like we had the buck propane meeting, we had the high school meeting, uh, we had the, you know, when they were gonna get rid of the dispatch, we had big public meetings. Were our, were our leaders there? Were our politicians present at those meetings? Those are the things that I'm concerned about. I'm one of the people, I'm one of the politicians, I'm gonna be at those meetings. When there's a hot topic, we need the leaders, the politicians, to come forward and stand, listen to both sides, all right, and then say, hey, if the majority is saying this here, well, Robert's Rules of Order say, hey, the majority wins, you know. When I'm told to do something, and even in my union, I may disagree with my membership on a particular thing, but you know what? I work for them. You're representing them. They tell me what they want. Right. And as the representative for the 86th district, I may not agree, all right, but if the majority says, hey, wait a minute, 
you're our voice in Connecticut in the legislative office building. You speak on our behalf, not what you think is best for us, but what we tell you what's best for us. Right. And that's the way I look at things. Right. Not every politician looks at it, okay? A lot of politicians say, hey, wait a minute, I'm going up there, I'm going to say what I think is right for us. Oh, wait a minute, that's not the way it is, in my opinion. Right, right, exactly. And, and um, I really respect that you know, perspective because that was always my perspective. It's like once you get elected to office, it ceases being about you, and it's all about everybody else in the room. Right. You know, and that's your job. Um, and there's so many topics we could talk about that have, you know, police accountability issues and taxing and tolls and all these other things. So we'll have to um, bring it back and we'll, you know, have a discussion about those. We don't right. really have the time. Um, what, what would you like to, how would you like to see us move forward, though, um, generally speaking, in the district? you know, at post-election, let's say. Okay. Um, I think what we'd have to do is we'd have to, with the town council, I think the um, representatives should be uh, attend more town council meetings, North Brainford, Guilford, Wallingford, Durham. They're our neighboring towns. They're our neighboring communities, okay? Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that they prosper as we prosper. Yeah, we want to make sure that we have revenue and, you know, uh, the mill rates and all of those things in the different towns are reasonable. Um, and we have to find a way to do that there. Doing nothing makes it stagnant. Right. And what I've seen for the past couple of years, I haven't seen much involvement from the political leaders to help us to find out where we're, where we're going to Help us head. uplift ourselves, right? right? Upli up, uplift the region, right? right? If Brantford does good, collaterally, we do good as yeah. well. And collaterally, you know, Guilford and Durham do as well, do better as well, hopefully, right? I mean, we're talking about employment, for example, you know, well, jobs expanding, you know, um, businesses expanding. Well, that's one of the things I thought should have been from March until now is how many people in the 86th district are unemployed. Mm -hmm. Now, currently at the national level, they haven't signed a new stimulus bill. How many of those people were waiting for that second stimulus right. bill to get going? Right. So where our local leaders, our local politicians say, okay, I want to know how many, who's in trouble? Email my office. Let's find out how we could help you. Okay. We, we have to find a way to help these people to get them back to work. And I don't think that's happening now. And I haven't read about anything happening that would be positive productive wise. Right. Okay, so we're gonna have to wrap up. Okay. Um, boy, half an hour flies right by. What do you like most about our area? Oh. The district? That's a hard question to ask because I'll, we're well, really lucky. <laughs> I grew up in Fairhaven. Yeah. I'm a city boy, okay? I grew up with the, uh, the street lights all night long with people walking 24 hours a day, sirens always going off. Uh, there were no crickets, there were no birds. Yeah, the polar uh, opposite here in North. Uh, I come out my front porch, I go right to the corner, there'd be 20 guys on the corner, we'd hang out on the corner. Uh, and that's the, the way I grew up. And when we first moved to Northford, okay, no street lights, yeah. right? Crickets. And crickets, oh my God, and frogs. They drove me crazy for a year. I had a hard time sleeping. And you walk out your house, when we were in Fairhaven, your, your house may be 30 feet wide, then a 15 foot driveway, then another house. On 200 feet, there'd be like 12 houses. Where but I live, it's, it's like an acre peace. of land. It's like, you have to throw a rock to the next house. So that, that has been different. And, All right, we uh, gotta wrap it up. I'm gonna have to cut you short. Okay. Um, I'm really sorry about that. Um, but Vince Mace, I really appreciate you joining me today. Um, and uh, hopefully we can do this again soon. Yeah. Um, I wish you all the best. Thank you Thank for you. your service um, to the community. And um, this has been another episode of I Want to Know. It's unfortunate we have to cut it short, but a half an hour goes by quick. Thank you for joining me, everybody, and we will see you again soon.